going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern. Saturday mornings with Jim Valley, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 Eastern. Sundays with Andrew Zarian. And it is Tuesday here on the show. You know what that means? Got a lot to talk about here today. Obviously, we've got all of these shows. We have AW Big Business coming up tomorrow. We have NXT coming up tonight. We got lineups for SmackDown and Raw next week. A lot going on there as we head to WrestleMania. Raw last night was, in fact, building up to WrestleMania. We got new matches for once. One of which is the challenger for Gunther's Intercontinental title. We know who that's going to be. We know what's going on with the tag team titles. They're going to have a six-pack ladder match. Something of that nature. And uh, tournament matches coming. Got updates on ratings. SmackDown numbers, which did very, very well. Collision, as well as Rampage. We've got SummerSlam coming to Cleveland this year. And, of course, we've got the latest on Vince McMahon. We now know who corporate officers 1, 2, 3, and 4 were in the Janelle Grant lawsuit. And we'll tell you who they are and, honestly, what this means right now. Which is not a lot, but it is an important part of the story. So we'll tell you about that here on the program today and plenty more. If you want to text us, 425-780-7566. That is 425-780-7566. F4Wonline at gmail.com. You can also find me on Threads, Instagram, and Cameo at F4Wonline. And the Twitter handle is at Brian Alvarez. Mike Sempervivi is going to join us after the break. Get his thoughts on everything. And uh, back in a moment with more Observer Live. Here we have the meditation room. This is a room where I send Vince when he misbehaves when he cooks my chicken, when it's undercooked, or whatever the problem is. It's only got two things in this entire room, completely empty, save for a chair right here, which um, you will notice it's made of videotapes. Unfortunately, there's so many tapes in this house that I have no room for furniture, so I did the next best thing, which is make a chair out of tapes. And he comes in here, and he sits down, and he reads. And I only allow Vince to read one book, because I realize that what you read and what you believe is what you become. And that is... The Law of Success in 16 Lessons by Napoleon Hill. This book was written in 1928. This book is over 70 years old. But the important thing is, the message is just as vital today. And while Vince will probably remain a lackey the rest of his life, it's good that he reads this and learns of the, um, basically the 16 laws which helped me become the success that I am today. And if you ever get a chance to pick up this book, it is a as you can see, night has fallen, and we've pretty much worked and toiled all day long. And, you know, one of the secrets to my success, and I've mentioned this many times today, many different secrets, but one of them is more time for recreation and just hanging out and doing whatever. And so we're going to be taking a trip down to the recreational facilities where the pool and the basketball court, basically everything else is stationed. And recreation is also one of the ways that Vince and I managed to keep our bodies in... Um, well, one of the ways that I managed to keep my body in such superb shape. So that's the next stop is the recreational area. Here we are in the workout area. Everything a person would need to get in perfect physical shape. Got the, um, you know, the bench press machine right here. Have the uh, leg press machine right there. We've got the, uh, what the hell is that? Got the, um, the uh, lat pull down machine right here. And uh, I suppose since we're here, we might as well work out and do the, uh, can you do 210, Vince? I can move it up to 110, or maybe to uh, Okay, go.
play basketball. The show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also WrestlingObserver.com. Before we get into Vince, the cause of Yutaka Yoshie's death has been revealed. Passed away Sunday following a All Japan match in Takasaki City. His condition is said to have, quote, suddenly deteriorated. He passed away, 50 years old. An article published by Tokyo Sports on Tuesday... Yoshie's family revealed his death was due to arteriosclerosis, narrowing of the arteries that carry oxygen and nutrients from the heart to the rest of the body. The bereaved family explained the cause of death was due to arteriosclerosis, said it is not caused by a professional wrestling match, so please don't worry about it. That's what they said. And it's essentially a heart attack is what happened, so... That's essentially what people had figured going in. There was not an injury during the match. Just uh, narrowing, hardening of the arteries. I mean, it can happen at any time. So uh, that is the update there. And uh, Tetsumi Fujinami was quoted. He said, I'm shocked. He was he was out of my house. He was a friend. I never dreamed I would hear such news. May your soul rest in peace from the bottom of my heart. So that's the update on Yoshie. And uh, I don't know if you have anything to add. I know you did a show on this yesterday, but uh, that is the cause of death. No, sir. Just not a whole lot to add other than it is so sad to lose somebody that young. Well, we've got uh, to talk about Vince. Here's the latest. Identities of several WWE corporate officers listed in Janelle Grant's lawsuit against Vince McMahon, John Laurinaitis, and WWE have been revealed. WWE President Nick Khan has been identified as corporate officer number one in the suit. Company COO Brad Bloom is the employer referred to as corporate officer number two. Corporate officer number three listed in the suit has been identified as Stephanie McMahon. Corporate officer number four listed in the suit has been revealed to be former head of the WWE legal department Brian Nurse. So these names came out yesterday, and uh, what does this mean? Well, I went back and read a lot of the lawsuit yesterday because I want to be very clear about all of this. I think what is abundantly clear here is that all four of these people, well, Nick Khan, I think all four of them, all four of them were aware that Vince was having a relationship with Janelle Grant. Did any of them know that he was raping or sexually trafficking Janelle Grant? There is nothing in the suit that I would say is evidence that they did. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. But... Stephanie, for example, I mean, for weeks now, probably longer, people have been talking about Triple H. Triple H must have known all of this. Stephanie had to know all of this. How, how could Stephanie know and not tell Triple H? Well, if you read the lawsuit, knowing that Stephanie McMahon is corporate officer number three, there are literally two sentences, two sentences in the entire lawsuit about Stephanie McMahon. One of them is that Stephanie invited Janelle Grant to sit next to her in a meeting. And the other is that Janelle Grant believes that Stephanie McMahon knew about other, I forget the exact term right here, other, uh, essentially she knew, oh, her father had, 
she may have known of other instances of her father engaging in inappropriate sexual conduct. Okay. Now, yeah, I guess it's new information that Stephanie is corporate officer number three, but obviously Stephanie McMahon knew that her father had been involved in inappropriate sexual conduct. Vince McMahon himself had talked about this in interviews. Vince McMahon had talked about this under oath. Like, everybody knew that. But did she know that he was raping and sexually trafficking Janelle Grant? We don't know that. We don't know that about any of the individuals whose names came out. So that's what's next. That's what we need to find out. And right now we don't know those answers. So... A lot of these questions are going to be directed at Nick Khan. Uh, the front office sports article that came out yesterday, which is written by Tim Marshman, of uh, he was formerly of Vice and in conjunction with John Pollock and Brandon Thurston from Post and Russell Nomics, they listed all four of the folks. And when it comes to Nick Khan, there are two very specific paragraphs in the lawsuit, and they go like this. Following Ms. Grant's messages to McMahon on March 9th, 2021, McMahon summoned Ms. Grant to his condo that evening for a conversation during which McMahon confirmed that WWE Corporate Officer 1, Nick Khan, indeed knew exactly who she was as McMahon had privately met with Corporate Officer Number 1 and Number 2, which would be Bloom, and advised these individuals of McMahon's connection to Miss Grant. In Section 246, right underneath that, McMahon continued this conversation by detailing to Miss Grant that they had expressed concern but were ultimately supportive. McMahon also advised Miss Grant that one or both of the corporate officers inquired whether Miss Grant could be trusted and that McMahon offered assurances that Miss Grant would not do something to hurt WWE. Now, those two specific points WWE responded to by saying that they take their obviously the allegations very seriously, but that neither Nick Khan nor Brad Bloom prior to the lawsuit being filed were aware of any allegation that Miss Grant of Miss Grant that she was the victim of abuse or unwanted physical contact. And then went on to say that neither one of them prior to the lawsuit being filed. Uh, again, this never happened is essentially what they're saying. These conversations, at least according to a WWE sports spokesperson, they are saying that they never happened. So really, when it comes to Nick Khan, a lot of it, he has spoken about this. He is. So now it's just kind of putting the timeline together and really being able to question him to figure out exactly when conversations took place. And as an example, did this one actually happen? So I guess that's going to come out here in the wash uh, relatively soon. You know, I, I would assume the further this thing goes, but you know, Khan seems to be, he's the one out of anybody here, and obviously Stephanie as well, too. But since he's there, you know, in the public, one of the public faces of that company, he, to me, has got some more things that he needs to answer to and some more things that, you know, people have questions about as far as the timeline goes. Sure, everyone does. All four of these people. I don't know what we're going to get at anybody, but um, I want to also mention Brock because yesterday... The story came out, we talked about it on Observer Radio, that he was, I guess, what was it, back on the roster page? Like he'd been removed and was put back on? Yeah. And then, you know, yesterday, I guess the, uh, I guess it came out that he was never off the actual roster page, so he was not put back on the roster page. So I don't know what's going on with the roster page, but I can tell you this for sure. Forget the roster page. There were a lot of things involving Brock Lesnar that after this whole thing came out, Ties, cut ties. You know, obviously one of the more obvious ones was, uh, you know, they were going to do the Gunther-Brock Lesnar match. That is off the table, as was made clear yesterday. And also, I believe that Brock is, is out of the video game. I can't confirm that because I've never played this video game, but I believe that is the case, that he's no longer in the video game. And there were other things involving Brock Lesnar as well. They were, you know, Brock was out, Okay. Whether he was removed from the roster page or not, they, they, they stopped doing a number of things involving Brock. Well, in the last few days, 
which ties into the story of him being returned to the roster page, even though he was not, uh, there have been moves regarding Brock Lesnar, which uh, if you listen to the show last night with Dave, everything we talked about accurate other than the roster page. There are movements to bring him back. So we can talk more about that after the break. Observer Live. I think it's my sobriety that keeps me going. Um, since I got clean and sober 15 years ago, it's it has put this kind of new shine on my life that I need to kick it into gear and continue growing and continue what I love to do, which is this wonderful business we're in and have some fun. And it's all about having fun. If you can't have fun at your job, then you don't really need to be in it. And I'm very good at what I do, so I love this business. And I just, uh, each time I go out there, it is an opportunity for me to be kind of a teacher for the youngins in the back because I'm very old school with a little new school attitude. So without the old, without the old school, there is no new school, right? So it's like all these people do the, all these impressive things all the time. And then what I like to do is completely different than that, and that's to tell a story it's very important to me because the fans kind of they have made us right so without the fans we're nothing and the, the fans that are uh going through their day and they might be having a a terrible day or whatever and they turn on the tv on AEW just to watch us it is my job to take them out of that day and entertain them but make them feel something that's the most important thing is to move somebody and to make them feel something because if you make them feel something they're going to come back and so that's that's kind of my my goal every time that I you know go out there. It's um, yeah, I get a lot ner I get a lot more nervous at my age for some reason, which is really weird. Um, and I think they're good nerves, but and I've always been nervous, but really since I've turned fifty, it's it's like every time I go out there, I'm just like, oh my god, man, I can't mess up, I can't mess up. Because, you know, there's people out there, they're going to be like, oh, Dustin needs to retire. And I hate that. I don't want that. I want to kill it each time. I want to put on a banger and uh, tell a good psychological story for the fans to enjoy. I don't think I really need to prove myself anymore. But I think it's just an internal thing that I need to prove to myself, hey, I can still go out there and do this, right? But as far as proving to anybody else, I, I believe... People know how good I am and, and that I can go out there and wrestle circles around some of the young ones, even still today. And um, we have some incredible talent and I'm just trying to keep up. I'm just trying to keep, in a word, young, right? And it's very difficult when you're 54, almost 55. But just to throw in a, a couple of new things by evolving your characters and changing things up every once in a while, I'm good at that. And that gives me a little more life and gives me a little longer to kind of enjoy it right before I need to switch it up again and I think that's the key to my career is evolving Back in the show, Brian Elber is here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. I should add regarding Brock, I'm not saying he's going to be back. I have no idea if he's going to be back. I wouldn't bring him back. But I can tell you that there have been inquiries made. And what that means, we will wait and see. But it seems, it seems like a bad idea to me put it well, that way if you're looking at this under the tko umbrella i mean look at what they deal with on the ufc side of things look at what dana white did look at what sean strickland says every time he opens up his mouth you know there needs to be probably more of a pushback a collective pushback and it's probably going to have to be more than just the online wrestling fans and the folks listening to this show it's going to probably have to be a lot more concentrated i believe and have a 
bigger concentrated response back if Brock Lesnar comes back because otherwise if they're looking at this as the bottom line and they're looking at it as things have blown over and we're going to bring this guy back even though we haven't even gotten anything you know further you know really since this whole thing broke I mean maybe that's just how they're looking at it is well we deal with this all the time on the well you know here's another one blow over I Here, mean, here's another one we don't know maybe nothing has changed whatsoever and they just decided yeah time has passed yeah. let's bring the guy back that could be maybe more information has come out that they are aware of where they've decided you know what you know he's he's i don't know that's that's the whole thing with this lawsuit that's that's like the crux of all of it is there's so much we don't know and more needs to come out before we can make declarative statements about a lot of things. This is a very, very serious legal issue. And, you know, my gut says, you know, whatever. That's not going to fly. What do we know? What do we have proof of? I mean, you know we have proof of? That Vince is a horrible person. We've got his text messages. We've got a huge chain of evidence regarding Vince McMahon and also John Laurinaitis. Beyond that, right now, we don't. And I know that, you know, everybody has their gut feeling about a lot of things. I do as well. But what do we know? What do we have proof of? That's where we're at right now. And, there are and a, a lot, lot of, more needs to come out. Yes, and there's a lot of really good reporters and really good journalists doing things, whether it be, you know, Pollock and Marshawn and Thurston or the Wall Street Journal folks. A lot of people are digging in because you look back at – Things that may drive in and may tie into this. Remember when Stephanie left? Remember when Stephanie all of a sudden got buried? Then all of a sudden when Stephanie came back because Vince was out. And then all of a sudden this woman who's doing a horrible job is now the CEO. All of these things. And there's so many other sub stories that come off of it that I know people are doing boots on the ground journalism for. So, again, this is a tough story because it's an awful awful story but we do there is some there is a level and i understand people's really getting upset and frustrated about it but there is a a level here where things hopefully all come out and again if, if this woman is not looking to settle then we are going to find out a whole lot if she's willing to take this and other people are willing to take this all the way to the end without a settlement so things get hidden again we're going to find out a lot more. And I have faith in the same way that we're seeing things come out. It may not be all the time every day like we want it to, but just like yesterday, the news coming out about officially, these are the four folks who they are talking about to throw out any thought that maybe one was Paul Levesque or maybe somebody was this person. It came out. So, again, I have a lot of faith in the journalists that are doing the, the work on this story, and hopefully they're able to uncover more and connect more dots. Also yesterday, in an unrelated note, TMZ reported that Miro and CJ are separating. And she confirmed the separation, said Miro and I have made a difficult decision to separate after many wonderful years together, decided to move on as friends, hopefully on-screen characters somewhere down the road. According to the report, the two separated in the fall, but neither have filed for divorce. And, you know, when this came out, this isn't, like, a groundbreaking story or anything like that, but uh, when this story came out, I suddenly remembered that months and months ago, I had messaged somebody that uh, that knew them, and I had asked, like, are they having problems? Like, what's going on here? And I'd, I'd totally forgotten that I asked, and the person said, I, I, you know, I don't know I'll, I'll, if I hear anything. But the reason I asked was because, remember when Miro came back to AEW? And uh, we can forget about most of the uh, storyline they were involved in. But when he first came back, the storyline was that he had lost his God and he had lost his wife. And I, I just remember being really weird, like, you lost your wife? Like, what are you talking about? This doesn't, I mean, there's, there's nothing in storyline or whatever. His, she hadn't even signed yet or anything, if I recall. It was just like his character came back and was talking about how he had lost his wife and he had lost his his God. And I just thought it was really weird. And this was around that time. So whole thing is just bizarre. But, I mean, we'll see. 
We'll see what happens in terms of both of them with AEW because they say they're friends and they had an angle going and they both haven't been seen in a while for various reasons. As human beings, I wish them the best. As characters on TV, no offense to Lana slash CJ Perry, I don't know if I'll miss her with Miro. Boy, I'd like to see something happen with this guy, whether it be in AEW or release him if he doesn't want to be there. At some point, you know, you you bring a horse to the water if he's not going to drink, shoot it and make glue somehow, make him buy himself out of his contract, let him go back to WWE. But in the time where he's actually been involved in something good, Rusev slash Miro has always been good. So I'd like to see that guy back as a wrestling fan. All right, we got uh, big business coming up tomorrow. Actually, we got NXT tonight, which I bring up because they just added the appearance of Trick Williams to the show tonight. We've got Obafemi versus Brooks Jensen for the North American title. Sean Spears versus Ridge Holland. Gigi Dolan versus Ariana Gray stipulation. If Ariana wins, she gets to uh, give Gigi a makeover. Make a lady out of her, I believe is what she said. <laughs> We got OTM versus the LWO, which actually should be an interesting match because Joaquin and Cruz del Toro are awesome, and Bronco and Lucian Price, you know, they're they're pretty green. It's the kind of match we get out of them. And Thea Hale and her mystery partner face Kiana James and Izzy Dame. <laughs> yeah. Then we've got big business tomorrow. They have announced Samoa Joe versus Wardlow. AW World title. Darby Allen versus Jay White. The Elite will be facing Eddie Kingston, Pac, and Penta. And that's the Young Bucks and, and Okada. Hook and Chris Jericho versus the Gates of Agony, which has been set up on television. And Willow Nightingale versus Riho. The other two things, hopefully we get brackets for this tournament, which begins on Saturday. If you recall, they once had that, uh, what the hell was the name of that tournament? The uh, Blind Eliminator Tournament. Remember that? Yes. And we had a Blind Eliminator Tournament where they started the tournament, but we still had no brackets. They were just <laughs> doing matches. We had no idea what was going on. I pray we have brackets on Wednesday. And also, allegedly, presumably, I don't have any evidence it's not going to happen. <laughs> or actually, at this point, even that it will, the debut of Mercedes Monet. It's expected Monday. to take place tomorrow. They've got uh, 7,500 tickets out. And aside from, like, those dollar signs on the uh, graphic, we've had no clues. And, you know, people have uh, I've noticed people going, why are you all over this? Like, you know, CM Punk. I mean, people didn't know either, but they all knew. Guys, do you forget all of the Easter eggs we had regarding CM Punk? It wasn't just they were going to have a show in Chicago. I mean, we had people doing his catchphrases. We had people doing his move. I mean, they you knew the day of the show. The only thing they've done for Mercedes is, I believe, um, what's her name? Anyway, somebody did a promo and mentioned being the boss. And there's been dollar signs on the graphic. That's it. And honestly, honestly, given the thing is called big business... There should be dollar signs. I mean, you don't necessarily... It was Serena Deep. You don't necessarily have to tie that into uh, into Mercedes, but, I mean, they have done virtually no hints about Mercedes debuting tomorrow. So... Well, at least they sold the tickets. You know, the TD Garden's a huge building. It's a 20,000-seat building. It's where the Bruins and Celtics play and everything. And I don't know what they originally had it set up for. It's currently set up now for about 8250 and they have all but about 700 tickets sold. So they did, uh, you know, they are going to get a good-sized crowd there, that's for sure. But, again, you know, the thing with Punk, too, and again, punk in chicago it's peanut butter and, and jelly sort of thing and i mean i hate to say this for and i don't mean to discount mercedes but you know it's been said before punk is a much bigger star than mercedes monet is especially at the times that they're coming into their collective to their organization i mean to me it's it's not you know a, a crazy comparison but it's kind of apples and oranges it really is and not not only that, I mean, if you've been watching WWE, 
I mean, God, that Bailey promo on SmackDown. How could, if you didn't know that Mercedes was going to dynamite, how could you watch that and not think that Sasha Banks was going to show up and help Bailey? It was all very weird, but that is tomorrow, and we got more after the break. Observer Live. on tonight's Portland Wrestling Card. Beautiful Brian Alvarez versus Adam Firestorm. This match is being brought to you in part by 1-800-OWN-A-CAR. Fans, just like we said, right back with another match. Adam Firestorm from Auckland, New Zealand versus beautiful or so self-proclaimed beautiful Brian Alvarez, LC, this should be another great matchup. Well, pardon me if I'm not completely into this matchup. Every time Miss Rento and Auto comes out, I can't help but stare at her two big, beautiful blue eyes, brother. Well, I, I believe that uh, that is what you're focused on for sure, LC. Miss Rento own not hat, Miss Rento and Auto, excuse me, not happy with Brian Alvarez two weeks ago when he was uh, losing to the grappler, but last week a victory over Ed Moretti and all seemed happy with the lovely one. Well, he's lovely, yes, he wants to be the pampered cow, but maybe he'll turn into spoiled milk, Jack. We got Adam Firestorm from Auckland, New Zealand, been dying to come into Portland wrestling. Brian Alvarez claiming that he pulled his hair, obviously he did not. Referee Mark Watson checking, he will have to keep a close look on the devious Brian Alvarez, I would rather call it in the beautiful one. There he is, whipped into the ropes, off he comes. Shoulder tackle, puts Adam Firestorm down. Back and forth action, Brian Alvarez. Flying big hip toss by Adam Firestorm. Another one puts Brian Alvarez down. Drop kick down on his back was Brian Alvarez. He's gonna dive outside, take a moment. Miss Rento Onato not looking very happy right there, LC. No, she's not, and youth gone wild, brother. Adam Firestorm is banging people like he's in a mosh pit, brother. Adam Firestorm going outside, gonna chase Brian Alvarez right back in. Adam Firestorm likes to control the action inside the ring. Oh, Brian Alvarez catches Adam Firestorm coming in with a kick in the middle rope, putting him down now, a boot to the face. Adam Firestorm maybe a little too energetic outside LC, not taking enough care of himself. That's right, he was all fired up, but that'll take the wind right out of his sails, and he need not worry about Miss Rento and Otto now after that shot in the gonads he just took. And then a hard whip into the back. Small of the back really put Adam Firestorm down. Brian Alvarez, now he's pulling his shirt over his head. Big chop across the chest. Adam Firestorm now, he's firing back. There's one, two. Now he's got Brian Alvarez, he whips him into the corner hard. Adam Firestorm following up, catches a boot to the face. Back in the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Semper, VB, also of WrestlingObserver.com. A couple of ratings notes. SmackDown did a big number, as one would expect, by holding off the Rock and Roman Reigns until the end of the show. 2.439 million viewers, a point six nine and 18 to 49. 2.8 million viewers for the segment with The Rock and Roman Reigns. They did, like, remember that that uh, right prior to them actually doing the interview when they had 15 minutes of nothing but ring entrances? Like, it was like 2.6 million viewers for nothing but ring entrances. And the uh, and 2.8 million for the actual segment. And, like, a .82 in 18 to 49. Over a million viewers in 18 to 49 for that Rock segment. So... And that guy is uh, something else, lighting the show on fire. So uh, that did very well. And then uh, Rampage and Collision. Rampage, I would say, largely normal, 364,000.13. But uh, this Collision number was not good. 
There was no WWE competition. I don't believe there was any sports competition. The show did 427,000 and a point thirteen. This was the first time ever when they didn't have a WWE pay-per-view that they did not beat Rampage in 1849. And the key is, I mean, we talked about the attendance. Like, the attendance was bad. They didn't have a card until the day of the show. You know, 2100, I believe, was the attendance. But the show aired on Saturday, and they did announce things on, you know, Dynamite. They, they mentioned Okada. Kazuchika Okada is going to debut his first ever AW contracted television match with the Young Bucks in a six-man. It's happening on Saturday night, and they did 427,000 viewers in a point thirteen. So this is not good. And I liked the show. I thought it was the best, like, in terms of, of matches and star power and everything. I thought it was the best collision in a long time, but people didn't watch the show. So... At least we've got tomorrow. I think tomorrow's going to do pretty well. I don't think it's going to do, you know, a million or anything like that, but I think, you know, they got they got 7,500 people, and I think that they'll probably do, what do you think? I say 850. Mm. Yeah, you know what? Because last week was the last week that's been under 800,000. I, You know, I'll say around 840. I'll go ahead and say 840 for that. Probably, and let's see what the peak is. That's going to be interesting, too, to see where she gets put. And if they put it towards the end of the show, you know, do we see, you know, we're at the top of the hour, do we see a gigantic spike, you know, pushing a million or or well over 900,000? That'll be interesting to see. But back to SmackDown for a second, because you just got back from Hawaii. And I got to ask you, do you have the, uh, the mana in you? No. No. Mm. Sorry. It's, it's pretty pretty lame here. Mm. So they announced it, SummerSlam 2024. You're just jealous you can't get a 20-minute promo like The Rock can. Are you kidding me? You want to wind me up? Uh, hey, look, I've heard what you want? What do you want to talk about, that uh, Maxine thing? I could go for an hour on that one. <laughs> do not wind me up on that one. Do not wind me up. No. Uh. It was terrible. Imagine waking up this morning and deciding today I will defend that segment because that's what I got today. Yeah, and then no names in particular. You and then you, you know they they brought up oh you love Christian, but I was like, <laughs> who? I didn't mention Christian's name one time on the show last night when I buried this segment. Not one time did I mention it. And listen, I don't want to do this. Yeah, but yeah, you know it's funny though. What? I totally got off what I was talking about. So they did this segment last night. I can talk about it more later if you really want me to. But uh, what happened was tiny, tiny, tiny little pixie. Like her gimmick is she is a pixie. Tiny little Candice LeRae bulls Maxine into the corner who is legit. She's got to be like 5'8". She looked seven feet tall next to... Wait, by the way, last time we saw character development that had anything to do with Candice LeRae, she was at her house with Johnny Gargano being a mother figure to Indy Hartwell. Yeah, Remember well, she's that. she's she's had a change of heart. Yeah. So, uh, you know, people change, Cody said. <laughs> so anyway, she bowls her into the corner, and she cuts this promo on her about how she sucks, and, you know, the internet thinks you're, you suck. Well, imagine what the women in the locker room say about you. And then she says, oh, you're going to cry? Well, it's a good thing your dead brother isn't here to see what an embarrassment you've become. What was that? What? What? And Maxine goes, I'm not doing this. And she goes to walk out, and Indy gives her a boot. A boot. She goes, bonk. Maxine falls down and is, is just, she just lays there. And Candace goes, cover. And she got pinned with a boot. <clears throat> So now Indy's Luchasaurus were uh, Candace's Christian. And here's the thing. Well, hold on. Before... Hold on. Go ahead, you go told ahead. me you'd go 20 minutes. <laughs> okay. For, let, let, let's, let's disregard the dead brother part for a second, okay? Taking Even taking that out, every last single bit of this absolutely sucked. Why did Candace tell her she's not taking that? She's not taking what that is it, move. It, it, It's a work. She's not taking that move. 
And then, you know, somebody else noted to me, it's like I had to I had to watch it three times to hear what she actually said because there was no microphone. So imagine, forget being in the, the cheap seats. Imagine being in the front row. All you know is in the middle of this match, Candace just decided to stop working and she'd shoot out Maxine in the corner. You don't know what she said. You don't know why. Whatever. Okay, so now, now let's talk about the, the line about the dead brother. You know, it's bad enough when, when Charlotte Flair mentioned the death of Reed Flair because if you followed wrestling even a little bit, you knew that Ric Flair's son died. But I listened to this and I thought, what? Maxine has a dead brother? What are you talking about? I do this for a living. I had no idea what she was talking about. No. So then I had to find out, okay, well, what happened with the brother? And then I find the story out that he had a a genetic disease. It caused part of his body to be paralyzed. He was prone to seizures. And so you can't drive. And so anywhere he wanted to go, somebody had to drive him. And one night he got a lift, and the lift got into a, a horrible accident, and he was killed. That's what happened. And horrible story. It's a horrible story that nobody knew that just came off so mean-spirited. And then, you know, I was brought up today. I didn't even mention Christian, but it was brought up today. Well, how come you don't get on Christian for this? And it's like... You want me to take that one? You could take this one. I mean, I can. Look, I'm not defending Christian. And when he said it to Daniel Garcia only a couple weeks ago, it showed how long in the tooth that whole deal about your father being dead is. But Christian was a manipulator in storyline. You, ha We all know Buddy Wayne. We all know the Nick Wayne story. Buddy was a worker. We all know this story leading in. And he took advantage in storyline of a confused kid that, you know, needed some support. He was just killed a couple weeks before that by Swerve Strickland, you know, like this dude. And so he manipulated that. Now, is it a great story? I'm not saying that it is, but it fit into what was going on and it fit into Christian as a personality. Again, not defending it. So how does that relate? Why should somebody, if we complain about this, with this out of nowhere, with everything you just said, go, well, what do you think about Christian? One, it's not the, the same. It, it may be in the same vein, but it's not exactly the same because there was all of this other backstory that led into it. And two, do two wrongs make a right? If you think the Christian thing is garbage, then why are you trying to defend what WWE did last night out of nowhere with this one? But... And you know, the other thing, too, is is uh, I'll be honest here, because I'm an honest guy. When I was asked about, why don't you hate the Christian stuff as much as you hate the Candace stuff? The answer, the answer, honest to God, is I don't know. All I know is I don't know how he does it, okay? But Christian has a way of delivering these lines where... It's just, I don't know what he does. But he says it, and it's just like, oh, what an idiot. That's your first thought. He's a great like, slimy pro What an wrestler. idiot to yeah. say something so stupid. And the delivery, there, there's something about the way he says it, where it's like you're you're watching like a movie or something. Yeah. Whereas, whereas when Candace is out there just saying, it's a good thing you're dead, there's a way that she said it was just like, God, this place is slimy. That's high school. It it's like just high school like bully style. Like, I don't again. know what it is, but it's uh, yes, Christian. Michael Booble, who actually the way I say his name is actually incorrect. Yeah. But he says sometimes it's not what you say; it's how you say it. And who is saying and that it? is true. And if you who honestly, if you honestly, honestly, forget your stupid tribalism and whatever, wherever you work or whatever, if you honestly watch the Christian promos when he does this and you watch the Candace promo, you will see it. You will, if you watch it. But anyway. Mm. And the other thing is, like, for, forget forget the brother. Forget we couldn't hear what she said. Forget the fans couldn't hear what she said. Forget nobody knows what's going on. 
What they're doing is they're turning this into a storyline based on that thing on Twitter for like 24 hours when that video showed up of a fan. One nerd Oon. told Maxine that she sucked and it blew up into this big defend Maxine thing on the internet and it was just like, now that's a storyline. How many people do you think watched Raw last night? 1.8 million viewers? About that. How many do you think were living and dying by that Maxine thing on the internet that won 24 hours? The vast majority had no idea what happened. Zero. It's just like, God, we're really going to waste our time with this on national television? You, you it was tell- one guy who was a jerk. Like, the whole thing is, Brian, okay, if you want to use that, okay, fine. But why not then just take her botches that she's had, take the internet reaction to her, and leave it there with that, with Candace going, I can't even get taken seriously, and I got to deal with you and say that as she's backing her into the corner as opposed to, and you know what? <laughs> you know, this is, you're, you're peeing all over your dead brother's grave. or You know, it just... It, why did it have to go launching into that? And then you go, well, you know, somebody that's going to defend it is going to be, well, you got to see the story play itself out and all that sort of stuff. But again, really? Do we? I guess we hey, You know what else out. is funny about it? It's also just so dumb. It's like Candace says, you think the internet hates you. You should hear what the women in the back say about you. <laughs> okay. So is this storyline that all of the women think that Maxine sucks? <laughs> So if that's the actual storyline here, Isn't that why is Rose's Michael Cole line? on commentary talking about, my God, she is proving she belongs in this match. What a bitch. It's like, Becky is she Lynch good or is she not? Like, no. what What am I supposed to believe as a viewer here? <laughs> is she good or is she not? I don't know. Man, Raquel must God. be. They're all terrible people, I guess. Mm. Back in a moment, Observer Live. There's one, two. Now he's got Brian Alvarez. He whips him into the corner hard. Adam Firestorm following up, catches a boot to the face. Brian, Al- Brian Alvarez with another hard shot to the head. One, two. This is the most aggressive I've seen Brian Alvarez today here in Portland Wrestling. Now he's got his knee across the throat. He's joking him, LC. Well, it's like this week Alvarez has something to prove, brother. Something to prove to his sweet little lady over there. Of course, Adam Firestorm with a big win over Black Dragon last week. Looking for another one here. There's a sunset flip. Is he going to go down? Yes, he is. Over he goes. One, two, three. It is all over. Adam Firestorm with the victory over beautiful Brian Alvarez here in Portland Wrestling. Now out Brian Alvarez firing away with a boot. Action continues after the bell. Goes for the back body drop. No! Face first plant by Adam Firestorm. Your winner once, looks like he'll be your winner twice. Action continues. There's a whip into the far corner. Adam Firestorm follows with a spinning kick. LC, I think Brian Alvarez has bit off more than he could chew tonight. Miss Rentone really disgusted over in the corner. Adam Firestorm not done. There's a lion sold on top. He hooks again, one, two. Two and a half. I thought we had a three count earlier in this match, LC. I was wrong, I'm sorry. I can't sorry. believe it. I thought Youth Gone Wild was just adding a little salt to the wound. I thought Alvarez was out of her head and a two-time loser, brother. Well, Mark Watson's hand must have stopped just short of the three count. And these eyes of mine need glasses because I thought I saw a three count. Brian Alvarez going up top. Oh, we'll forget about your cataracts, brother. Up and over he goes. Nobody but- home. Adam Firestorm back in control, playing a bit of possum. He's climbing up top as Rento and Otto really upset. There he goes. Swap oh, and that one yet. There's a hook to leg. One, two, three. Now it's all over. A two-time loser. And does the LC have to look after Miss Rento and Otto tonight, baby? There's Adam Firestorm, your winner in this match. Once, twice, three times. It didn't matter. Brian Alvarez not up to a Miss Rento and Otto. Absolutely disgusted with it. Mark Watson explaining to him it was a three count this time. No hook the leg. Fair and square, Adam Firestone. Your winner here on Portland Wrestling. Fans will be right back with a after a message from our sponsors.
I knew it would happen after that. Uh oh. What? Oh, Booker of the Year, Triple H. <laughs> hey, listen. Every Booker, every single one of them, book something stupid at some point during the year. Every Fact. last single one of them, okay? Fact. If you don't like the promotion and you want to cherry pick that one stupid thing and say that person's a terrible booker, of course you can, okay? But the rest of the show, hey, a lot of good stuff on the show. We had an excellent gauntlet match. Sami Zayn was awesome in that match. He won. He's going on to face Gunther at WrestleMania. It's exactly what you figured was going to happen, and it's what happened. Didn't do something stupid. He's probably going and... I'd say 99% certainty he's beating Gunther for that title. He had, uh, the, what do they call it? Six pack something or other. They've got uh, a bunch of teams are going to be facing the Judgment Day in oh, a uh, ladder match to get him on the show at WrestleMania. And apparently it's Tozawa and Otis as the team that is going to try to get in oh there. Oh, my means God. Chad Gable is going to be open, it sounds like, for Mania. It'll be interesting to see what they end up doing with him because if you believe that Brock Lesnar is actually going to come back, I mean, is that a situation that you put Chad Gable in and you have those two wrestle? I don't no, know. I don't know. We're going to find out. we still got a lot of got a lot of matches still to add for WrestleMania. And we are, uh, what's March 12th? Got three weeks left, something like that? Yeah, at least we got eight, at least so far. I don't know how many officially are said, but at least we got, uh, they're starting to come together here. But yeah, hopefully they get on this a lot more soon. Let Jimmy answer Jay and let's get it going. We're out of time, everybody. I want to thank you all for listening today. I'll be back later on tonight. The Brian, Vinny, Granny, Craig, and Sean show. It'll be WWE or WWF Wrestling Challenge, Season 1, Episode 2 from, I believe, 1980. I think six, maybe 87. 86. 86, so check that out tonight. You do not have to watch the Billy Jack Haynes match. We decided that one can be axed. But anyway, that's it. We'll talk to you next time, Wrestling Observer Live.